what do you think? Out or in for this? Well, if you're going to do the persona out. Out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. Just... Welcome to the Cosmic Conversation. Today, my guest is Timothy Tate, who is an archetypal psychotherapist in Bozeman, Montana, and is someone who deals quite regularly with uh, conditioning, ideas, uh, thoughts, patterns, and how people deal in their daily lives um, with a lot of these inherited and imprinted uh, thoughts and ideas. Thanks for being here, Timothy. My pleasure, sir. It's good to have you. So there seems to be a couple categories of information that we deal with as humans. Some of the information is genetic, one might say sort of pre-programmed. Sure. And then there's the other information that is um, sort of programmed, conditioned, stuff that comes from our environment, our families, and uh, comes from the world in which we live in. Now, in your work of dealing with psychotherapy and with people and, and their issues, how do you deal with those two types of information, or, or are they two different ones for you? Sure, I think the first one you're talking about is our biological predisposition that comes with our genetic mix that is the consequence of the sperm and eggs tango and what they fertilized and what was there to be fertilized yeah. and how that story went in the nine months it was incubating in that soup of the womb and all the forces in the mom's mm. uh, body and then mm -hmm. the man's sperm that are igniting this uh, life impulse, we might call it, this mm -hmm. life force. Yeah. And so here we are, and there are people like Artie Lang who thinks that nine months is the most formative period of time of all. But right. whether it is or not, it certainly is fundamental. So that's the biological predisposition, which okay. sets the charge range of the capacity of the brain, that sets the mood calendar of how the moods are going to swing and what the predisposition to perhaps bipolarity is or to depression is mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. to a certain kind of inherent capacity. Mm -hmm. Like what seems to be a normal child is now seen to be uh, an Asperger's child six years after he was born. Mm. And everything changes now about how we're going to be with that predisposed energy that took a little while to reveal itself. Okay, right, right. So the time, things can come out at different times in people's lives and therefore that sort of throws a wrench into that theory of, hey, was that something that I was taught or was that something that may have been inherent, inherently conditioned within those nine months, um, so to speak? Right, and that can come about in a scary way in young adulthood, late adolescence with, for instance, what we call schizophrenia. Mm. called late onset schizophrenia, mm -hmm. which I've had in my practice just about three or four times with men who snapped, if you will, or lost their way into a separate reality when all was functioning quite well. Mm. Maybe the trigger was an accident, maybe the trigger was uh, psychopharmaceuticals, maybe the trigger was recreational drugs, but then what was latent becomes dominant. Gotcha. So those forces are real. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. not as uh, large a force as modern medicine and brain search would have us believe, mm. but they can't be discounted and mm -hmm. just said to be a factor that you can get past. Right, right. And so today's day and age, um, people are looking for what I've heard referred to as some quick fixes. Like, sure. I got this kind of a problem. Can you just fix me? You bet. And And... How does that kind of a com uh, comment resonate in your practice? Well, there are plenty of quick fixes, uh, but they don't last. That's the problem. Mm. My practice is dedicated to what's sustainable. And to me, all I know what's sustainable is an evolution of consciousness that comes via unique ways for each individual. I can't tell you there's not a way to do that for everybody, mm -hmm. but the quick fix doesn't allow sustainability. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, within 24 hours, 48 hours, certainly within a week, if a person's coming in with depression, a person's coming in with anxiety, a person's coming in with marital conflict, we can medicate that person with a quick fix 
and self-help exercises to manage what's going on and have them have a sense of well-being mm -hmm. and nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to feel good? But oftentimes you have to go really into feeling a lot worse before you can come around and feel better mm -hmm. in a sustainable way. Quick fixes don't allow for that cycle. Okay. So that kind of seems to bridge into the idea that um, what we are sort of conditioned to believe that we are is a smaller version of what we are. Um, Clearly. So let me, um, let me read this comment and, and see what your thoughts are on it. Inherited thoughts, innate animal, breathe, eat, reach. Then there are imprinted thoughts from our conditioning. And those are not just do's and don'ts, but ideas at the very core of our being that we are inadequate. How did they sneak that in? <laughs> well, and really, all, and really, yeah. how did they sneak that in? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is pretty damn sneaky. You're right in using that word. So what you're talking about is that deeply held belief that we're inadequate somehow. Yeah, and I think, you know, with cosmic sense, trying to reach into a larger common sphere, yep. you know, a person like me has come to this idea of like, well, how did everybody get convinced that they were less than? Yes. It's not that we should feel bigger than the universe, or, yes. but how is it we all sort of have felt comfortable or have you know, allowed ourselves to sort of accept this idea that at our very core, like down at that very base, we are inadequate. Yeah, well, it is a long story, and we're going to roll the tape back to about 5,000 years ago. Okay. And we're going to take a look at some things that were laid down there. Mm -hmm. And what we need to keep in mind is this is the basis, the sense of inadequacy is the basis of all religion. Right, right. And that even, that crosses from Western to Eastern, yep. is that correct? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about Judeo-Christian heritage, if we're talking about Muslim heritage, if we're talking about any organized religion, there has to be a fall from grace involved in the mythology. Mm -hmm. There has to be some leaving the Garden of Eden story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's that fall from grace which we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about the, the beauty of full union when we have a child, a fetus, an infant, however you want to describe it, in the womb of the mother. That's complete union. Mm. Then we have this process called birth, which stretches that union and the umbilicus is cut to finish that separation. But now we have, for you know, around a year, year and a half, a complete union still with the mother because the child's focusing capacity doesn't make a distinction. Mother and child are still one. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then we have cognitive functions kicking in. We have behavioral capacity kicking in. Mm -hmm. We have the capacity to control or not control the bladder mm -hmm. or the stool. Mm -hmm. We have these things that start to challenge parents on how to have a well-behaved child. Gotcha. And the well-behaved child notion is the epitome of what we agree is normal. And that normal has been written for 5,000 years, but it has something to do with obedient, respectful, controlled behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. And have, okay, is, there, yes. is there other cultures in our history that say didn't teach this or didn't have didn't have shame. Was there a way to do this without shame? Yeah. Did, yeah. It, ha did it ever <laughs> exist and happen? It, it did and still does, mm -hmm. although in kind of uh, changed formats, I suppose. What would be the way to talk about indigenous cultures today? Right, right. They're but deeply indigenous connected. indigenous cultures had no word for shame. Mm -hmm. And we're not trying to glorify some, you know, uh, native consciousness here because that's regressive and we're past that. Mm -hmm. But there is a reason that we have become civilized and it's come at the expense of what something might be called native mm -hmm. or natural. Mm -hmm. And that's the quandary here. Mm -hmm. The price for civilization is shame. Mm -hmm. That's the entrance fee 
to civilized life. And this is, this is so indetectable and this idea is almost implanted at the same time that you get your name mm -hmm. that um, it's not something that let's say a quick fix can just get rid of. No, it's so inherent within our own belief about ourselves that we shame ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's how deep it is. We bought it so much that we look for reasons and in our private thoughts are hard on ourselves and critical of ourselves mm -hmm. and judgmental of ourselves mm -hmm. about things we did or didn't do or say or didn't say. Mm -hmm. That's how deep it goes. Mm -hmm. We bought the script and use it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when we think about the indigenous way of doing this, what happened up to the first 12 or so years of a child's life was, and we have a remnant of that in our society's language, wild little Indian. Mm -hmm. You're behaving like a wild little Indian. Haven't you taught him anything yet? Mm. Well, the wild little Indian comment is, and to this day, you could go to the Crow Nation and see lots of wild little Indians. You could go to the powwow and see lots of wild little Indians under 12 years old. Because the principle is, have at it. Mm -hmm. Have at it, whatever. Mm -hmm. Because they understand that the child within us is wild. Mm -hmm. They also understand, and this certainly used to be more intact when the cultures weren't decimated by civilized society. Uh, that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah. But the remnant still suggests, then you had initiation. Yeah, I was going to say, that seems like what, you know, what you're doing is setting up a scenario where there's no way that this kind of behavior of a child, this wildness, is sort of going to just be the way that you live your whole life. No. But that in these cultures, there was a serious transformation through some form of initiation and really trans and really, I mean, you're out of it. You're no child any longer after that. And, and if you um, live through the initiation, you're no longer a child. That's how serious it was. Yeah. I mean, the stakes were that high. And the stakes are still that high. What is going on when you look at our culture and you see the issues that we have in our culture? Um, regarding this, um, let's say, the lack of initiation or the lack of complete initiation um, from child to adult? Well, what we have in our culture, consequently, is random self-initiatory acts on the parts of adolescence that drives everybody cuckoo and scares the bejesus out of everybody because it's initiatory experience, whether it be driving and drinking, whether it be unprotected sex, whether it be experimenting with street drugs or pharmaceuticals, the list goes on. Every parent who might be listening to this or every kid who might understand what we're saying knows what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's, so we have lost the rights of tribal or group or social unit initiation, and in place we have self-initiation behavior because it is, if you will, an archetypal force. That's what my practice is dedicated to, mm -hmm. is understanding archetypal forces and how they play in personal lives. Mm -hmm. Well, initiation is an archetypal experience. It's not going to disappear because we killed all the natives. Right. Right. It's going to have other forms, and that's what we're wrestling with now in our society, is uninitiated adults dealing with self-initiating adolescents. And we can have a mm. talk about the, what that train wreck looks like. Mm. Well, that train wreck looks like the world we live in today, mm. if I'm if, uh, to be so glib. So one of the contexts uh, that I sort of bring up in this particular episode is sort of extra personal. It's sort of this idea that, that I had that was, hey, you know, if you took a newborn baby in Montana and you took a newborn baby in Shanghai and you just switched them and raised them in those separate places, they'd have the genetic information there, but that Montana kid would be speaking fluent Chinese by the age of three, and same for the Chinese child in the United States. So there's, I've always been sort of, okay, so what is the common ground that we all as humans sort of occupy in this space? What are the essential parts of what we are? And so the idea of shame 
taught to us that at our very core we are inadequate, that seems like a real relevant um, program that we've been given. That's running in our biocomputer, so to speak. Yeah. So uh, how does this, it's not just how does this program run, but what does it look like when it's running, you know? Can you spell personality? <laughs> I can, not on uh, camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it looks like. Our personality is our unique, tailored, complex compensation for feeling inadequate. That's all personality is. Okay, so help to help define that and right. get some more. So to help help uh, you know people watching to understand. So what what personality is? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's roll the tape back again to its origin, which is the word persona, which was a, a Latin word mm -hmm. that had to do with the mask. Uh, persona dramatis would put on to perform in the play being performed that night. So he'd put okay. a mask on. Okay. That mask is called a persona. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can kind of see where we're headed here. The mask that I have to put on to function normally in my society is my persona. That's the root word of personality. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who have been studying shame for the last 30 years, and there are a number of us who have been doing this, mm -hmm. uh, we have understood that there are six basic components to the structure of the personality, which are compensations, cover-ups, for feeling inadequate. Because we understand there is nothing more devastating to the person than to feel inadequate. Yeah, that feeling of inadequacy, it just, just sucks your energy anything. out anything to avoid that feeling. People would well, murder. People will kill to avoid that feeling of inadequacy. Do every day. It's happening right now yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Somebody's been cheated on, feels inadequate as a man, and is shooting somebody as we speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The scenarios are available in every newspaper every day. So a lot of the behaviors that we sort of collectively agree as a culture, oh, these are bad, we are almost essentially uh, stuck not even dealing with the causes of these right. as much as just trying to cut the symptoms off or, you know, well, not just not dealing with the causes of these. No, we don't know how to deal with causes in our society. You earlier mentioned the quick fix. We are geared towards a kind of mentality that has to do with the superficial, and that's what a kind of consumer-oriented society does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's how you look, it's how you appear, it's how you manage your possessions, etc. And this is not a critique on neo-capitalism, so we'll let that slide. Mm -hmm. But what we're saying is there are three forces that embed shame in our biocomputers programming, mm -hmm. and that's the home, the school, and the church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by the time the child is in eighth grade, I mean, is eight years old in second grade, which is my kind of mark for when shame has completed its run, its, its, its construction, its influence, its embedding. The program has been com completely loaded. Cinched up and completely loaded and Operate. spinning okay. is second grade. Okay. Talk to anybody about their second grade experience hmm. and they'll tell you stories hmm. about yeah, kind of like suddenly got serious. Hmm. You know, I had to bring something home and show my mom. You know, we yeah. didn't have nap time anymore. Yeah. The teacher mm -hmm. graded my behavior. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so that is an interesting kind of cultural marker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we're saying is that the persona is the way in which our human beingness has developed a system, a software package, to manage the feeling of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. And there are six ways we do that. Okay. Six ways. Now, and I just want to help get this across. There's six ways. So the moment that something activates that shame within you, yep. the moment that hits, there are six things or six basic categories that you're saying happen right after that moment. That's right. And those are? There's five like that and one different. Okay, okay. The one that tries to beat all the rest, so you don't have to react and feel that sense of inadequacy at all, mm -hmm. is our favorite pastime in Western civilization, and that's called perfection. Mm, perfection. 
perfection. Yeah. If I'm perfect, how can I be inadequate? Right. That's the game we play in our noggin. Boy, that seems to be, a, the, is that categorically the biggest one? Yep. The biggest cover up. For Western civilization. Yeah. Yep. Clean, and clean, clean, clean. Yes. Clean, and clean the house. Yeah, and it's at the root behind all obsessive compulsive disorders. Mm. And, you know, Western civilization is on the spectrum of OCD. <laughs> you know, we all have some of it going on. <laughs> yeah. You know, to the if extreme. You're here, you're right. in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, so if I learn as a bright kid, and we're all bright kids, what I need to do to be loved and to be good, I will dial that in and be perfect at managing that in actual and symbolic ways over the rest of my life because I want to be loved and I want to be good and I don't want to feel shitty. I mm -hmm. don't want to, excuse me, no. I don't want to feel Came inadequate. Right All right. Swear. Okay. Well, don't <laughs> open that door. Yeah, I won't. <laughs> uh, so, perfection, and this was certainly my modus operandi. Um, is if you can get everything perfect, if you can beat the person to the punch about what they're aiming at and thinking about in the conversation, if you can keep your room, your house, your village, whatever size you're managing environment, orderly and perfect, if you can keep the way you look perfect, if you can keep the way that you manage the values of the society perfectly, if you save, if you spend within your means, if you do all the things that we might agree on as normal. Mm -hmm. Because all we mean by perfection here is doing normal perfectly. Okay. Okay? And normal is its own dysfunction, but we might get to that. Okay, okay. So perfection is a way of beating all these other compensations. Okay, so I see. Perfection... As soon as you feel that spark of shame, immediately you just get on a track towards trying to be perfect or doing nope, something. Nope. No, let's no? back that up. Okay, okay. No, you're constantly feeling inadequate. That's why you're being perfect all the time. You don't oh, need any reminders. You don't need it. So you okay. are constantly beating that in your own way of being perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. What you're talking about is, let's say, I'm uh, doing this interview with you and I feel like I'm not doing it well. Mm -hmm. and I feel a little inadequate about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do one of five things. I'm going to have contempt for you for putting me in this position. Okay. I'm going to try to get the upper hand, have a superior position, be the authority. Okay. Lord over you what I know. Okay. I'm going to get angry and have a temper tantrum. How dare you put me in this position and make me sound like a fool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to <laughs> withdraw and get sullen and quiet and hide and have you try to find me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to blame you for this crazy idea. Mm -hmm. So withdrawal, rage, as in temper tantrum loss, just really mm -hmm. blame, superior position, or contempt are the other five. Mm. Yeah, and I think something that's always got me is, has been related to that what you mentioned earlier as far as our need to look perfect. And you just, look marvelous, by the thank way. Thank you so much. I do feel like I've, I'm looking my best for everyone. Good. And, uh, and so something that's always got to me was how, boy, they convinced people that it was a real narrow window like you really got to look like a real perfect kind of image. And then what dawned on me quite quickly after that was how the people that look like that, they still feel inadequate. Right. And they aren't happy. Right. And so when I see other people on the streets, there's so many different appearances for human beings. And it just really bums me out that mm. someone's been convinced that they're ugly. Because mm. it just, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's not like we can all walk around feeling beautiful, but it's kind of, to me, a bit of a wound to see that, that sort of pressure, that the persona, like you can see someone and it's sort of like you look at them and they project onto you like, oh, I'm ugly. And I look at them and I don't see that, but I know like, oh, in this world, you know, it, it just happens. That's right. 
Um, and it really breaks down on gender issues, I think, in many ways. I think girls, mm -hmm. women, really bear the brunt of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We as men have another set of circumstances around that, what it means to be handsome, what it means to be fit, mm -hmm. what it means to be virile and attractive, of course. Mm -hmm. But with girls, I think, you know, in the age from 12 to 20, that zone right there, the force you're talking about is brutal. Yeah, so shame and just the ideas and how that propagates through our culture. Um, like when you wake up, let's say today in today's world, when you wake up, what do, are there behaviors in, like if you open the paper or you uh, look at something on the internet or walk down the street, what, are there things that immediately remind you of how uh, we are entrenched in this program of shame? Well, I think a couple things come to mind there. Uh, one is that what we're talking about is so basic and fundamental to our sense of reality that we call it unconscious. It's already so deeply running that we don't even know this program's running. Mm -hmm. So each of us have to really engage in a therapeutic experience to even dawn on the fact that we are not our personality. That's a huge step in a person's life mm. to have that realization. Mm. Once you have that realization, and you will have that if, you, if we do our work well, because your personality has got you into some pickle. <laughs> and that's why you showed up at your door. Right. For, okay. Yeah, Correct. you're bankrupt, you had an affair, you blew it somehow, your personality dominated you for as long as it could, and then it got you into a pickle that the personality can't get you out of. Mm -hmm. Then you got a problem. Yeah. That's the good news for psychotherapist, because that means you can't depend on your shame-based personality to run the show anymore. Okay. Yay! That's when we start talking about transformation. Yeah. And so in this transformation from... Um, Describe this transformation, like what is a reasonable approach to this? Because we've been talking about just how deeply ingrained, you know, this part of the program is. Sure. Like in this glorious being of light that gets into a denser and denser body and then is incarnated. And then this extraordinary spirit is slapped with one identity, one culture, one name, one persona. Yes. And that that persona and those shame ideas and that identity are so based to our existence. Right. Someone might say, well, why even go to psychotherapy? Because you can't do anything. I mean, but what is it that you can do? And how, how does work go about when, when someone awakens to the, to the personality uh, issues that we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, well, that's a hell of a question, right? <laughs> well, I got it out, now you just serve an answer up and it'll be fine. <laughs> yes, you do. And go. And here it is, it's coming <laughs> at you, okay? So just in terms of defining our uh, definitions a bit more, our words yeah. a bit yeah. more, uh, persona is different than ego and is different than character. And those are three terms we need to use if we're going to understand the question you just asked. Great, okay. So back to what you began with, the biological predisposition and the formative experience in the womb and the birth experience and the first year out of the womb. Okay, I like the nine months in, yep. nine months out anniversary. Okay. Okay, that's ego. Okay, so that ego is the hard printed hard, uh, the software imprinted. It's the motherboard. It's the motherboard, okay, gotcha. If we're using it's, the biocomputer as a model, system. it's the operating system, okay. hidden within the definition of the machine we're talking about, of the person we're talking about. Gotcha. Ego. Yeah. Then the persona starts developing in that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth year. Okay. Okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's an adjustment to shame. Right? You got that? Right. So it's almost like something that builds up over the ego, kind of like you use the image of a mask. So I see a mask that's maybe like getting stuck to your face and becoming you. And it is Absolutely. You. Okay. That's right. Okay, no, so it gets that's, stuck. So yep. that's persona. Yep. That's persona. And it's, it's assembled, it's reproduced, it's formed according to a couple pivotal things. I mentioned being loved and being good. A while ago, those are mm. two of the forces that mold the persona to the form that it needs to be in your unique circumstances. Mm -hmm. What does being good mean to a meth addict? 
It means blowing some smoke and trying to smoke a joint when you're five years old. That's good. Mm, you mean like for a parent? Right. Know, so yeah. That I, I would feel loved by my meth head mom if I'm smoking a joint with her when I'm in kindergarten because she loves me. She thinks that's hilarious. Isn't oh, that fun? I see. Right. Or love and good might be, you know, if you poop in your pants one more time, mister, I'm sending you away to boarding school. If you think this is tough, wait till you see what's coming your way. Mm. Boom. Both of those are ways of adapting to what the parents' belief of good is and normal is. Okay. So yeah. each person has to kind of reflect on the meaning of good and being loved. Then we have how you manage the instinctual forces. How we as little creatures learn how to manage instinctual forces. Hmm. How we pee and poop, how we go to sleep and wake up, how we eat, how we manage our aggression, how we do our dependency, and how we are creative or not, that force of really wanting to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's the next formation of how you are trained with your persona to manage instinct. So love, being loved, being good, and how you manage instinctual drives are the forces that shame uses to modify this wild energy, that life impulse that we all have to be acceptable. Okay. And there's nothing more effective than shame at that. That's why it's used. Bring that kid in line. If I can break your spirit, if I can make you feel inadequate, I got gotcha. you. And then all of a sudden, he's a well-behaved kid. No problem. And then what happened later? <laughs> <sighs> because the whole reality of that kid has gone underground. Right, the persona has buried something. Yep. So that's what I was saying. I just did a quick kind of overview of what we mean by the unconscious persona. It's mm -hmm. so a part of what you consider, what you have to be, to be loved, to be good, and to manage these instinctual forces that mm -hmm. you don't have any idea of its effect on you or its impact on you. Mm -hmm. You just act it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So ego, persona, then we have this wild ass card here called character, mm -hmm. which is the force that you came into life with that the ego either provides you a vessel for or if you have an unfortunate situation of childhood abuse within those first three years of life, two years of life I was talking about when the ego formation happens, yeah. now you have what's called a personality disorder. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're vessel, your ego, your container, your vehicle for this life has been so damaged and violated that it can't hold the process of what we're getting to, your question about transformation and change. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. It's now identified with being broken. Right. And that's called a borderline personality. Narcissism is a personality disorder. It's those kind of things. And if you ever get that, anybody, on your mental health record or on your insurance form, you're screwed. Oh, really? Nobody will have anything to do with you from now on. If you have a you borderline broken. person. That, oh, wow. So you, you got broken right out of the gate and here's another slap in the face for you, so to speak. To change that requires a minor miracle. Yeah, that is extraordinary. Those, that kind of a incarnation is pretty hard to fathom. Very tough. And I, can, and I think what, what you're touching on is the idea sometimes that their shame is so powerful of a force in us that many people who may start to try to deal with this issue deep down, maybe they get a lead to get towards a practice or towards something, when they open that door to, to get in to take a look, it is right. just so vast and so deep and those problems go so far back in their being that they just don't feel like they have the strength to even deal with it. And so they shut that door, they go back to themselves, and that's the person that you say identifies then as with the broken personality. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think mm -hmm. when you come to therapy, it's a risky business in any shape or form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the ego's broken, 
we oddly enough call that a personality disorder, not an ego disorder. Hmm. So it gets a little confusing. Yeah. But all I'm saying is, let's say with the broad majority of our citizenry of our population of human beings, there's not the personality disorder. 3%, 5%, less, somewhere in there? Yeah, I'm not sure. We, oh, I won't get lost in percentages <laughs> right now. But let's say the average Joe and Jill, you know, mm -hmm. coming to therapy, mm -hmm. having problems sleeping, having financial problems, having marital problems, getting sure. stuck because their personality made them choose to do shit that blew everything open. Mm -hmm. They come in, they don't have a personality disorder. So now, opening up and investigating ourselves is still incredibly challenging. Yeah, oh, I agree. Because the main request for anybody coming to seek therapy is all I want to do is be happy. You know, can we get me back here? I've lost myself. I don't feel myself anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I've made some mistakes. I feel awful, whatever. So reflecting on that is the next step. And how we do that is simply by hearing the story the person brings and breaking them the news. Guess what? You are not your personality. Mm -hmm. How's that sit? Mm -hmm. How does that work with, with the people that you work with? Uh, well, it's, it's one of the junctures or crossroads in anybody's story. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about some anonymous people. We're talking about ourselves. We're talking about each other here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about what it means to face yourself and come to terms with who you really are that you've always had a sense about, but you felt you had to betray in order to be loved, to be accepted, to be normal, to be successful. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, the reason that Goethe's plays Faust is so popular and continues to be replayed as well as Shakespeare is because they talk about these archetypal themes mm -hmm. and the agreement we made with the devil mm -hmm. to get accepted, to get wealth, to get whatever. And that deal with the devil we're talking about is accepting the persona as an identity. When in fact what we're trying mm -hmm. to bring the news is, no, it is your way of covering up your shame. So it's corrupt. It's based in the wound. Is that how you want to flop around the rest of your life? Is driven by your wound? Mm -hmm. As long as you're in your personality, shame's in charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's weird. Yeah. Character is the promise of our own divine nature. Mm. Okay. Not Christian or otherwise, but our divine nature, something that you know a bunch about. Right. Beyond the concept of religion that, that we've created, just that divine essence. That... Our spirit. Right, right. What, what is the human spirit is all I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Our character is our spirit. Okay. The character is something latent within you. Um, and I think it's important uh, for us to also make the point that character is sort of like beyond like what, any social, social norms. So there's some guy who's just making pottery in o Ohio, um, and all he wants to do is be a stockbroker. Yep. And there's a stockbroker, and all he wants to do is be a potter in a small town. And so I think it's hard in our culture, we really understand the idea of, of the stockbroker quitting to be the potter. Mm. But we don't understand that character is so big that there may be someone who's driven to be a stockbroker and that that is an act of character. That's right. You know, so it, I, guess, I guess one way of looking at this is it's very hard to judge a book by the cover here. You, when you look at a human being, how can you tell where they are in their, their own being as far yes. as are they on the road to the character or good question that's where you want a psychotherapist who's good at assessment oh okay <laughs> somebody who can kind of give you a readout after a session or two of what's going on mm -hmm. uh, and give you a sense of the and psychotherapists aren't demigods we don't have the crystal ball that can see truly into your nature but somebody like myself who has been practicing this art since the early 70s has a breadth of experience that sure. we have 
in a tradition mm -hmm. of a, a shaman or a medicine man or an elder or a wise one mm -hmm. that is so archetypal in the human experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who can see into your true nature. Mm -hmm. That's the archetype of the wise one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He can't be fooled by your personality. Ah, right. By the presenting, this is what I am, this is how I am, I need to fix this, my husband's an asshole, if we just get rid of him, I think I'm gonna be okay. Yeah, Story. yeah, yeah, gotcha. Huh. The wise one sees into your character and shows you the conflict between your personality and character and invites you to the party of your character. Mm, mm -hmm. And basically invites you to the party that you open the door and it's all these different parts of you. Yes. And so in a way, like the work we're talking about that you do is actually very, very challenging. Yes, and you do mostly with your eyes closed, which I love. Oh, dreaming. Yes. Sir. How the dreams reveal. Yes. Mm. Your dreams will reveal the nature of your persona and the essence of your character. And getting to know your dream time is, in my experience, the most effective path. Mm -hmm. I'm not dogmatic. I just like what works. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by works is transformation from persona to character. Mm -hmm. And character doesn't mean anything in particular. It just means that you're kind of yourself. You're naturally you, and you know that when you're in the company of somebody who's themselves. This isn't any big mystery. There's an energy, there's a presence, there's a vibe. Right, yeah. Be it a kid or being an adolescent or an adult or an old person, you just feel comfortable in their presence because they're comfortable with themselves. Okay. Yeah, so let's move, let's jump ahead into the idea of okay, how, how to deal with this and what are the, some of the um, the ways that uh, transformation occurs um, when, when uh, you know, opening this door to uh, try to seek your character, that part of yourself that you've always wanted, that's always been you, mm. that's been fighting the personality for so long. Yeah. Well, um, like what is the work that people sort of, you know, kind of just giving people a sense of so what kind of road, you know, blocks or road map of just what, what's that like? I mean, each person obviously is very different, but having seen 35 years of this journey, um, just to give someone an idea of uh, what it's like to, because we've talked that you can't get rid of it. No, don't so, want to do that. So what do you do? You develop a relationship to it, how? And, and Okay. Well, uh, a short crash course in this would have something to do with uh, having the experience of being troubled in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So currently that's anxiety. Mm -hmm. Depression used to be it. Now anxiety is the forerunner mm -hmm. of complaints, right? Okay. Um, so there has to be a presenting issue that is strong enough to get somebody through the door, through the threshold, into the presence of a wise man or wise woman. Mm -hmm. So already something's moving. Mm -hmm. Now the next step is how do you want to be with what's moving? Do you want to get rid of it? Do you want to medicate it? Do you want to use what the conflict is for growth? Because mm -hmm. there are different ways to go here. Okay. If you want to medicate the symptoms, I got plenty of people to send you to. Mm -hmm. If you want to repress the symptoms, by exercising more, by working more, whatever that might be, I got people to send you to. Mm -hmm. If you want to grow, then you're going to have to face your shadow. You're going to have to face everything you've avoided. Because in that is your power. Yeah. That's where the secret juice is. Uh -huh. It's hidden in your shadow. Everything that you threw away and hated and were afraid of and avoided is what you have to reclaim. So the first step is kind of understanding this framework. The second step is doing shadow work. Mm -hmm. Meeting all in yourself that was driven away by this feeling of inadequacy. So in a sense, uh, it's almost like sort of the demons, the nightmares that you clients bring in is a signal that there is some aspect of their being that they have banished and maybe even for great reason at the time, 
but now you have to uh, enter a dialogue with it. Yes. What does that dialogue look like for some people? I mean? Well, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's very creative, it's very expressive, it's very challenging, mm -hmm. it has to do with a lot of mayhem and murder and death and awful things and uh, intruders and rape and uh, gun battles and running from people and hiding mm -hmm. and running and not getting anywhere and missing the test and failing the exam and waking up in a panic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it starts, just to reel it back a little to help people understand how this is sequential, it starts with the childhood nightmare. Mm -hmm. And those childhood nightmares are the child, human being, first experience with shame. They, they are terrified mm -hmm. of these demons coming at them. And that is their own internal way of expressing how they're losing their connection to their natural self. Right, sort of um, in the sense that certain... Uh, cultures or religious cult, uh, practices talk about the integration of the levels of the chakra and that there's lower and higher chakras and so we're talking about not becoming the lower one but cinching it off right trying to cut off cut it off right and so it says you can't cut me off right I am part of you that's right and it shows up by in your dream time absolutely okay. absolutely uh, as mm -hmm. in the Christian mythology or story or reality you choose, uh, the highest angel was Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And so he fell from grace and is in charge of hell, the underworld, mm -hmm. and so the brightest one is locked away in the darkest place. So when we start therapy, we will have within 48 hours, Kind of fun to play the little wizard here. <laughs> you know, if you come to see me, looking like I look in my office, mm -hmm. and I'm telling you, you're gonna have a dream within 48 hours. Right. That's gonna help us get oriented on where we are in your story. Mm -hmm. And inevitably that happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a whole dream, but a An great image. image. Sure. Yeah. So the dream time is our impeccable narrative of where our unconscious is in relationship to our idea of our self. Okay, right. Now I'd like to have us move forward so we yep. have the idea of ourselves. Now what I want to do, and you know, this will be tough to finish up in the last 10 minutes, is to say, okay, let's take this shame mechanism, this culture that we are now, that we see in the present moment, yep. and let's place it in the cosmic context of a changing reality that we are in. Okay, right. And this change, again defined by many people, is in essence, from a cosmic standpoint, an upgrade, a sense of a, a, a software upgrade, a vibrational upgrade. There is something to that effect that is going to be occurring or is occurring. Um, how do you, well, first of all, how do you perceive this event in, and how do, does it, um, do you think that it plays with, with people in shame at this time? Mm -hmm. Well, there's this idea of critical mass uh, that the Jungians are friends with and like, and that is once you hit 1% of consciousness of previous unconscious content, there's a shift in the paradigm. So basically when enough people think a certain thing, it shifts the paradigm. Right. Examples of that have been tragic in our society in recent times and perhaps mm -hmm. for modern times. Whether it be JFK's assassination, mm -hmm. whether it be 9-11, mm -hmm. or whether it be the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. where there's a critical number of X number of tens of millions of people, 1% of 33 million, 330 million people would be, let's say 30 million people, would have to hold that charge of the same consciousness in order to shift the paradigm. Okay. What we might be suggesting is there's another kind of event or moment coming 
different than those that will give the collective an opportunity to hit critical mass and to shift their consciousness and be informed past the shackles of shame. Mm. Do you, uh, in your practice, do you work uh, with people um, under the idea of this transformative energy? Um, that, that's, it's, I guess it's sure. beyond the person. So It's um, transpersonal. Transpersonal. Yep. So um, as we shift from paradigm to the next paradigm, mm -hmm. does this affect how you work with, with um, your clients? Well, I think it does. I think it does. You know, the effect it has is, is basically, you know, back to a saying from the 60s, which is either you're on the bus or you're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got to be on the bus. Mm -hmm. You got to catch this ride right now. If you're going to still be identified with and attached to the shame dynamics of your personality, I really don't have time for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we're out of that kind of time. What we're into now is the leap into how consciousness from time to time takes a leap. There's lots of information about that, both scary and exciting about the next leap of consciousness. You mm -hmm. know, the fish had to do it from the water to the land. Mm -hmm. You know, the dolphins had to make it from the land to the water. Right, that's right, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we have times in the story of this beautiful life energy of a need to make a leap. We're in one of those right now. Mm -hmm. So this shame-driven mentality, which is basically hierarchical, basically patriarchal, basically monotheistic, basically repetitive and unreflective, is done. 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 A dollar is now a piece of paper. Dollar is now a piece of paper. Shame and religion and all that structure is done. And so I think, you know, uh, most people are not wide enough to understand a lot of this stuff and they may sort of wake up and see these things as done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what kind of a message uh, can someone like that receive uh, to not freak out about it? I mean... Oh, you're going to have to freak out. You're going to have to freak out. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. You're going to have to freak out. There's no way around freaking out. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. consciousness only grows through conflict. Mm -hmm. Consciousness does not evolve if it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. Why would it? Well, that's an interesting thing because we're really sold comfort. I mean, we're really told that our greatest dreams and our greatest aspirations, be them material in a house or land... All of these things are just based on making us, making us feel more comfortable. Absolutely. Well, that yeah. seems pretty terrible. It's, it is. <laughs> it's terrifying. You know, uh, just talking with a 21-year-old man, and he just really wanted to be safe. You know, and that's so sad. Mm. Because the kind of safety that comes with this organized reality that we're saying both drives social norms and fires and fuels personality, the kind of safety it promises is a form of insanity because it's a split within yourself from your true nature on a bet that being normal and acceptable to that which has shamed you will get you further. Yeah. And you know, who gets the... Uh, who even hears that there's another way? Do you yeah. know what I mean? That's the, such a trap. It's almost like you have no road maps. The only map you're given, the only street signs here shown are the ones that are going to lead you down that road. Right. And you really a, have to hunt to find someone like you or a person that's working on a different level yep. to start to break, break It's called that. the hero. The hero. The hero archetype has never had a map. Mm. You're just called by something nobody else can hear and you have to leave home, and you have to go off and slay the dragon, mm. face the demon, mm -hmm. that is the inherent drive to reach beyond consensus reality. Mm -hmm. So that's the hero archetype. You have to have that mojo going 
if you're going to transform. Otherwise, you're going to find ways to be comfortable, which is really a way of losing your spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, Timothy, if I were to ask you um, to maybe just give a, a short message or a short uh, piece of advice to all the various cosmic viewers that are going to be all over the world in all different ages and all different languages, um, what sort of a message would you um, try to propagate uh, to them at this time? Mm. Well, I think uh, what we're talking about takes great courage and it takes great capacity to accept that who you thought you were is a version of yourself that has a lifespan that is shorter than your actual life. Mm -hmm. The persona is not evil, it's not the enemy, nor is shame. It's archetypal to the human experience. We go through a fall from our natural self while we're in this embodiment. This itself is really confusing, this container we're in, to our soul energy, shall we call it. Mm. So there is going to be a realization that who you thought you were, how you thought you were, what you thought you had to do to be normal, to be acceptable, to be loved, to be good, was a great idea for what its purpose was, which was a way to adjust to society. But in, if we're going to be able to advance in a conscious way, we have to put down those childish things and realize that our personality can't take us through our life. It's meant for like 20 years, that's its tenure, mm. 25 years at most. Mm -hmm. Then we have to face ourselves, that's where the courage comes in, mm -hmm. and it will be brought to you or you can initiate the facing. It'll come. It'll either kick you in the butt or you can bring on the and usually if you initiate it yourself, you'll have a, advantage. A, an advantage. Advantage is key. It is. Um, but if not, then uh, some, it's gonna some, come. something's going to kick you. But knock on the door is going to come. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just sort of a sense of like, you know, and I have this too, just that sense of, hey, you know, go for your character. You know, who knows what it is? You know, it looks kind of ugly at times to to break out of that persona, something, you know, will change in your life or people will view you differently or something, but... Sure. Tough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you identify with your persona, you're going to be neurotic. Mm -hmm. That's the consequence of identifying with your persona. And we're all neurotic and mm -hmm. we've all identified with a persona. Mm -hmm. All we're saying is that doesn't have to be the whole story. So if you can learn to have some tools, if you can learn some of these tools we're talking about, you no longer have to identify with your persona. You can start taking that persona off your character and the experience of doing that is one of joy. So you have to be ready to let go of this fixation with happiness, which is part of this compensation package of shame-driven persona. Mm -hmm. Happiness is the answer to that. Mm -hmm. And be willing to experience joy. Mm. Well, uh, I really appreciate you mm. taking some time to be part of the cosmic community. And Me I too. Thank everyone for hanging with us on this conversation. And, and find wow, that Wow, that just turned off.